Good morning! Would you like to join me in recreating the pattern of a woven ribbon from over two and a half thousand years ago? This is actually one of my favorite tablet weaving patterns and also one of the oldest tablet woven trims found in Europe so far. Hallstatt is a beautiful city in Austria and it was in the salt mines of Hallstatt that they made an amazing discovery of wood, leather, textiles and other organic materials that are usually not preserved in other conditions. I can't speak for the rest of the discoveries, but three tablet woven trims were among the discoveries and their complexities range from beginner appropriate through to skillful and a good grief, how did you come up with that? Now, because I am me, but also because I wish to show you just how amazingly skillful prehistoric artisans could be, I am going to recreate the pattern of the most advanced of the three. Wish me luck! Our process begins simply enough by making our warp, and to do this I am using my dwindling supply of lovely plant-eyed wool that is spun tightly enough for tablet weaving. I have chosen blue and green as my two base colors, with my pattern standing out in a much lighter yellowish green. This squeaky little winder turned out to be a very helpful friend, as the distance between each of the four legs of the wheel is a little over 25 centimeters, meaning one full turn is almost exactly a meter. I am just making a small two and a half meter long warp this time. I've woven this pattern before and I know I'm in for a bit and a half. Once all 84 of my threads have been bound up to equal length, I can secure one end with a ribbon and cut the other off. Since this is such a short warp, I'm not braiding it. I'll simply tie it to the nearest sturdy post and get started threading my cards. For this pattern, we'll need 21 of said cards, or tablets. I am a bit spoiled for choice and have tablets in a few different woods. These are walnut and oak. And by separating the edge and center pieces by color like this, I can quickly see where I am. These beautiful cards are also waxed and polished, making them that little bit kinder on my threads. All four corners gets a thread for this pattern, and all our threads must go through each tablet from the same direction. I'll post a link to the article by Karina Grömer, where the pattern is from, in the description down below. I also tie off the threads on each tablet individually. I didn't once back when I was a wee beginner, and let's just say that when I pulled my cards back to get as much as possible out of my warp, there was a bit of a tragedy involved. Do not recommend. The original warp of a ribbon was horsehair. Not something I have easily to hand, so I am using hemp instead. It will not really be visible at the end, so it is not worth using valuable plant-dyed stuff. Oh, and a quick reminder. I know this looks a bit wonky, but if you are weaving with the backstrap method like I am, please remember to tie your backstrap over your hips, not your waist, to protect that feeble lower spine of ours. And then we just, as they say, go for it. One of the really neat things about tablet weaving, as opposed to many other forms of weaving like rigid heddle or warp weighted looms, is that you can move your cards independently from each other throughout the entire process. This gives you a unique opportunity to manipulate the warp in a way I am not aware of any other method being able to do. 
So rather than brocade, where a second weft thread is usually passed over a predetermined number of warp threads to create a pattern that sort of floats on top of our fabric, with tablet weaving, we are also able to decide which cards in our deck have their pattern threads facing up as we pass our shuttle through the shed and which threads are facing down and will be, for that particular section, not visible on the top of our ribbon. You could also absolutely combine the pattern making skills of tablet weaving itself with the intricacy of brocade in one and the same awe-inspiring ribbon, as has been seen from ribbons discovered in, for instance, the Osobatic ship burial some 1000 years later. But I digress. And just to remind you, as far as we know, it is unknown how these pattern sequences were taught or even remembered as these prehistoric artisans were weaving. Were they passed on as tales around the fire? Or songs to keep the rhythm? Did they have some sort of drafting system lost to time? Nothing like pattern notation has been found for tablet weaving this far back in history that I am aware of. A detail I am absolutely not about to try to replicate as my pattern is my absolute lifeline in this reproduction. One full sequence of the pattern is 72 different picks or card turning sequences, most of which are unique combinations of our 21 tablets going either a quarter turn forwards or a quarter turn backwards. Make no mistake. The brain or brains who developed this pattern was a master of their craft. This whole thing just screams intelligence. The only exception to this individually turned card madness are the edge cards, which are either all turned clockwise, or when it has just built up too much twist in the warp to keep going, turned a half round in the other direction and turned counterclockwise every pick until such a time as our edge warp has yet again built up too much twist and we turn them all clockwise again. The rest of the pattern is what is known as twist neutral, which is a common feature of historical ribbons, meaning each card is turned the same number of times forwards and backwards over the whole sequence, leading to no twist buildup as you weave. I wish I was able to show you this, but I did make a mistake in the beginning and had to restart entirely, so you will see some twist buildup on my pattern threads. And to think that our prehistoric brethren might have been doing this from memory or song just amazes me to no end. Then again, it has been documented that the memory of people who could neither read nor write was much better than we can probably imagine. One of the many tales in the Inquisition archives talk about a group of people from the French town of Montaillou who made their way over the French Pyrenees and into Spain around the year 1370. Some of them from a brand of Christianity known as Cathars who were hunted ruthlessly by the Catholic Inquisition. So detailed and impressive were the memories of the various members who engaged in this journey that when they were interrogated by the Inquisition, we can cross-reference the different interrogations as they were recorded and see that whole conversations match up word for word. I don't know about you, but that is not a feat I will be repeating anytime soon. And while this pattern is swift and merciless to show you any mistakes that you made, I did discover one small way of at least correcting the mistake for ongoing weaving. Since all the cards in this pattern are turned either a quarter turn clockwise or a quarter turn counterclockwise, that means that they are always either aligned or 180 degrees opposite. If a pattern thread is showing up where it shouldn't, I can turn my card 180 degrees 
or a half turn in either direction and as long as I have turned it either clockwise or counterclockwise and not forgotten to turn it in its entirety, that should solve the issue. My wooden cards were actually helpful here, since that meant the grain of my cards were either all aligned with my warp or perpendicular to it. Anything else and I would become suspicious. Have I mentioned yet how I have always been fascinated by weaving? Sewing is an apocalypse skill to be sure, but to be able to spin and weave cloth from scratch? That is magic. And while I have always wanted to learn to weave properly on a big loom, you can still get a lot done on the small portable methods like this. You might use tablet weaving to create sturdy ribbons, belts and straps, and rigid heddle weaving to create wider pieces of twill or plain woven cloth. All possible with backstrap, suitable for travel kits and small places. If that is not an apocalypse skill, I don't know what is. Here you can see me fighting to tease out a last handful of picks before I have to call it quits. And here you can really see how the twist buildup on a few cards is what is stopping me from going a little bit longer. But alas, we are going to call it here. This ribbon is a gift for someone else, and I do not know yet if they would like for it to be a trim to decorate a garment like how the original was used, or as a sturdy belt. If it is the latter, I will come back and braid off the ends at some point. But for now, I will just leave them alone. And that, felted wool slippers and all, is our reconstruction of the Hallstatt tablet woven ribbon number one. Once I got into the groove of things, I could do two rounds of the pattern in about one and a half hours, and one round produced nine centimeters of ribbon. That left me weaving at roughly 12 centimeters an hour, breaks excluded. Simpler patterns can be woven much faster than this, so I imagine something like this would have been quite valuable at the time. My ribbon is two centimeters wide, while the original is a mere 1.3 centimeters. I can't even begin to imagine the skill involved in spinning thread that is almost twice as fine as what I used, but that can still withstand the rigor of cards constantly being rubbed back and forth against it. Also imagine just how much more impressive the ribbon would be at almost half the size, but with all the same details. I do hope you enjoyed this little deep dive into some prehistoric shenanigans. And if you are so inclined, I do have a Patreon where you can help me and the Voidlings continue aforementioned shenanigans, if that is something that is of interest to you. Many thanks to those of you who are already there. For now though, thank you for watching and fair travels to wherever the internet takes you next. <laughs>